Leave it to Governor Newsom to drop an atomic bomb on the automotive enthusiastic world this morning with signing an executive order that changes the game. And for our counterparts, Donut Media, Hoogan, and Hot Rod Association are not taking it lightly. This is your big guy with the eyes in the sky, Craig. Steven's here with me. Sit down, shut up. Hang on to your gear levels. This is a spicy one. Another episode of Short Shift. After an extremely long night of tossing and turning and having panic fears about weak, underpowered, underpowered cute utes, we awakened this Wednesday morning with California Governor um, Newsom pushing the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, to establish regulations requiring all new cars and passenger trucks sold in California to be zero emission compliant by the year 2035. What does this mean? That means no more WRXs, no more Supras, no more big rig trucks. They all have to be shifted to zero emission, which means they're going to be all battery powered. He does this as a direct attack towards combating the climate change inside of California. And there's going to be extreme huge pushback from automotive makers as well as manufacturers, as well as the people, because we didn't bring, we don't want this onset to be brought to us. California is formally known as kind of like the, the headquarters for hot rodding and racing inside the United States. Um, you know, the, the hot asphalt nights and the beach boys and all the, the drag racing in the fifties and sixties. But on top of that, California is also known for relying on transportation for its commerce. It's 30% of the income that California gets comes from the transportation sector, be it passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles, um, things like airlines, trains, and, you know, even boats. A majority of the U.S. gets its overseas vehicles from the Asian countries from the major ports in L.A. and San Francisco. So the whole... 2035, all vehicles must be zero emission, throws a giant wrench in our plans, and it's having everyone really shook up right now. Steven? Yeah, so there's a lot to break down here. Um, so just bringing out a couple of things that uh, are more specifically spelled out in the wording of his executive order. It's 2035 for cars and light trucks. And also drayage trucks, which are basically your transportation methods for moving stuff around inside of a not on the road area, like inside of a port or something like that. And then 2045 should be medium and heavy duty trucks also going all zero emission. I don't know how feasible a lot of that's going to be. And even if it is feasible at what cost to the taxpayers, it's going to be to start, you know, pushing that. We've already seen a, a giant fail for the city of Los Angeles when they had used $10 million of taxpayers' money to buy I-3 police cars that barely lasted four years of service before the police realized these things can't do the job. There's even stories about other police departments buying out um, super expensive Teslas for police cars and then midway through pursuits and their routes running out of power. Um, it It is... It is left field to wake up this morning and find out that, hey, California's going to go all electric in a state that isn't very mass transit friendly and doesn't have the infrastructure to support zero emissions. California is renowned for not being mass transit friendly to the point of where if you want a vehicle, you move to California because this is where you can use the vehicle the most. The only other state that would compare to the kind of like privatized, you know, transportation would be like Texas and you damn near need a vehicle if not a horse and you can't make a horse zero emissions compliant. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of places we could go with that. However, uh, keep in mind myself and Craig agreed when we started this whole shenanigans to not make this a political channel. So we won't go there. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I do think that electric vehicles are going to be the future for a lot of situations. For a lot of people, in a lot of places, it makes a lot of sense. I don't think that mandating them, though, because they don't work in every situation. Uh, the one Craig was talking about for police cars, uh, the battery slash recharging tech and everything else right now just isn't there. Um, for people that do, uh, like, field service technicians or engineers that, you know, travel a lot for work all day, every day, it, it's just not there, man. I don't see it working. 
And uh, for people that live in the city with a, you know, five, 10 mile commute to and from work, even 20, 30 mile commute to work, stay at work all day, commute home. Maybe uh, maybe electric cars are a good option for them. I can totally see that. Hello, weren't you at one point in the recent past considering a Mini Cooper EV, Craig? So we're not sponsored by Omaze, but everyone who watches YouTube videos and has an online radio show should know about Omaze these days. You, you basically put in money towards a raffle and a thing gets raffled off, be it a vacation, uh, an ability to be a, a, a famous Hollywood actor or sports player, or sometimes vehicles in this case. And currently up on Omaze, they have a, an all electric Mini Cooper E that is being raffled off. And I am, for one, one of the few people in the demographic that have the ability to not only afford, but utilize the E in its intended environment. My commute to work is less than seven miles. Um, with a hundred mile, 110 mile charge, I could do a whole week's worth of commuting to work and back. And, you know, not a jab at any other car manufacturer, but Mini Cooper can make one hell of a fun, spunky little car. And from what I've seen on some reviews, the zero to 60 time is, is not fast, but it's rather spunky. So this vehicle makes a whole lot of sense in my mindset. That being said, I'm not being forced to buy that vehicle because it's nothing optional. It's something that I want to do as, you know, to pursue the endeavor and kind of bring myself into the next market. I will still very much have my 600 horsepower V8 truck because America. America. But yeah. So yeah. Uh, um, go ahead, Craig. No, I'm it's it, just going back to the whole, the, the forcing the change like this is, is kind of counterintuitive for the, for the means, right? It's taking away kind of the, the buyer's choice. A hundred percent, hundred percent. The right thing. So this has and happened I, before in the automotive industry and I've, I've bitched about it before and I'm sure we'll bitch about it again. Yep. But, uh, so my take on this, uh, if you, if the technology, whatever new technology it is, I, I don't care, right? We could be talking about EVs, seat belts, backup cams, whatever, if it's actually better enough to justify the cost of development, the consumers will let you know that. Right. If you make it, if you make it an option, which it already is, right. There's electric cars out there and there's more coming. Yep. Um, we talked totally. about this in a previous episode. Most of the major manufacturers are yep. either in development or already selling an electric car of some kind. We see Honda making movements saying, hey, 30% of our sales want to be all electric in the coming future. Toyota obviously has their hand in the electric car market. Ford and Volvo. Volkswagen. Yeah, and Volvo. Thank God for yeah, the Polestar. So like, if, if the market wants that and the people want that, mm -hmm. uh, then that will be seen because those things will sell. And if they sell well and they're able to sell well uh, despite their cost of development – then companies will continue to develop them because it's what the people are buying. That's how yep. it works, right? Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's that uh, that theory has worked out for pretty much every other automotive technology. The ones that are good and everybody wants have, at this point, become basically standard because they've become expected because they're good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and we could make an entire episode, maybe we will one day, about automotive technologies that got tried that didn't work for one reason or another. Yep. Uh, but what it comes down to normally is the cost of the option or the cost of the technology wasn't worth what it uh, what it gained. Wasn't, you know, nobody found it to be cost effective, so it never hung around. And I think we're trying to force that issue on electrics when they're just not quite ready for prime time yet. Not only right, that, as Craig was talking about, go ahead. Yeah, not only that, but the the technology and the materials that go into all electric vehicles is exponentially more expensive than your basic internal combustion engine vehicle. It is way right. cheaper to make a small displacement shit box, if you will, pass a modern emissions compliant than it is for a company to come out with a super Wyoming all electric vehicle, and then you know have to pass the stringent requirements for it being all electric. Um, especially with the advent of this new autonomous driving and electronic braking and all this stuff. Safety regulations have been kind of tripled for electric vehicles because it enters a new era and new type of failure that we haven't seen before. So that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing to talk about too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you have electrics. Uh, there was a, f 
like two that I can think of um, series hybrids with mm-hmm. a pure electric drivetrain and a generator on board, mm-hmm. which I feel like, in my opinion, that's where we should be headed right now as far as transportation appliances. Just because of the, st- the size of the U.S. and the way that battery tech has been developing so far, I don't see pure electric working out for the great majority of the people in the U.S., it's just not there, right? The distance between locations is too great. The amount that people drive is too great for the range that we're able to get and the recharge rate that we're able to get. That said, I 100% agree with the people pushing that electric drivetrains and electric motors and controllers are more thermally efficient and more energy efficient than internal combustion. I'm on board. Like, I'm with it. 100%. We just need to go about this in the right way. Right, we're yeah. making we're making strides there now already. Um, you see more and more uh, like Fiat 500Es, uh, those little uh, what was that other thing? The Kia Soul I think has an EV. Yep, I've seen a few of those running around. I've seen actually several handfuls of the Volkswagen EVs as well. They yep. seem to be pretty popular. The uh, the Golf E is actually owned by Jason Camisa as one of his daily vehicles, and he had done everything yeah. in his power to make the Golf E not fuel efficient by. St- putting on sticky 280 treadwear tires and stiffer suspension. But at the end of the day, it is very much a golf, which is very chuckable. And for guys like himself and myself in our positions where we live inner city and have access to, you know, home charging every night makes a whole lot of sense. And that is, that's the proper way to, I think, to kind of move the public into the all EV era. Um, One of my old driving instructors from way back in the day, we're talking 2008, had said that the future of automotive ownership is going to rely on one gas vehicle as a peep remover to, you know, go do vacations and camping and head to the middle of nowhere and have fun. And then there's going to be an all electric version for running around town and doing, you know, the day to days, which I still firmly believe is where we should be going. Yeah, that's uh, that's very possible. Like I said, that was my thought on the electric drivetrain with a gen set as being uh, one of the ways to solve this problem. You know, something that can you can charge every night and never has to fire up the generator on your day to day situation, but it still gives you the option if you decide or you need to undertake a you know five or six hundred mile road trip. That's an option, and that's I think the thing that a lot of people forget about, especially urban inner city types that haven't been in the rest of the California or the rest of the world or the rest of the country. Uh, it's something we get a lot from the Europeans as well. You know, people don't understand that thousand mile road trips in the States are absolutely a thing that happens on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, here in the States, we need vehicles that are capable of that. Hell, there's places out West where a couple hundred miles between gas stations is possible. Yeah. And even long, common. There's a, long, there's a long stretch of road in uh, Utah to Colorado where you need to make it 230 miles between gas stations. Yeah. A 110 mile range EV vehicle is not going to make that. Yeah. To say nothing of how long you have to charge at each stop every 110 miles, but just straight up can't make it. Yep. So, yeah, um, that's pretty much my take there. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with the whole electric vehicle thing coming down the pipe. I'm actually kind of on board with it. I am an electrical guy by trade and by nature, but I think we're going about it the wrong way. Uh, for all of you out there, uh, let's hear what your thoughts are, uh, both on this situation in California, which I'll go ahead and take my obliga- oblig- <laughs> Damn it. Uh, my obligated jab here at California that... Uh, you know, they're communist as hell, and uh, they're pretty much murdering the auto industry. Sorry, Craig. I'm sorry that you're stuck out there. <laughs> 11 more months, we'll be free. What's that? I said 11 more months, and we'll be free. Right. But uh, for everybody else out there, tell us uh, what's going on in your neck of the woods. What's your take on uh, electric cars being the future and how we're going to get there? What the What the right answer is to get us there? Or maybe that's not the right answer. Maybe rolling coal diesel bro dozers are the right answer. I don't know. Well, Any parting shots, Craig? 
Well, if you want to join us in our discussions, um, feel free to find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page called The Broken Axle Podcast. Uh, more than likely, you're listening to this on YouTube, in which case, give us a like and subscribe and leave us a comment. Uh, I frequent our page once in a while and kind of give thoughts and insights. We are definitely looking for more information to kind of feed to people, and we do like to stay up to date with events. You can find me on Instagram. I'm at nomadic.wheelman. And uh, you can find both of us on Facebook as well, Stephen being at Can't Drive 55 and myself also being again at nomadic.wheelman. Um, I think this is a huge affront, and I can't imagine this is going to be a staying policy. That being said, these are strange times, and uh, for now, go out, support your local junkyard, and go bust some knuckles.